All right, everyone. Uh, good evening and uh, thank you again uh, for joining us for this program with Maine Historical Society. My name is Kathleen Newman and I am the Manager of Education and Programs at Maine Historical Society. And uh, thank you so much um, for joining us for this virtual book talk this evening with Ron Romano. Now, just a heads up that this program is being recorded. So if you need to duck out early, uh, or if you know someone who couldn't join us live tonight, but who might be interested in viewing this later, the program is being recorded um, and will be shared on our website. I would imagine probably within a, a week or so with, with editing and turnaround, it usually takes about a week to get these online. So tonight's program uh, is a book launch uh, with Ron Romano. Ron is a native of Portland, Maine, um, who spent his college and uh, some of his career years in Boston um, before coming back to his hometown, 2011. And he serves on the board of Spirits Alive, the Friends of Portland's Eastern Cemetery, leading their walking tour programs uh, and participating in stone conservation and researching gravestones and their markers at the historical burying ground. He is a frequent lecturer on stonecutters of Southern Maine and has guided groups through many historic cemeteries in the area. His original research on the life and work of the stonecutter Bartlett Adams led to the publication of his first book in 2016, uh, Early Gravestones in Southern Maine, which is a great book. And he's also uh, the author of Portland's Historic Eastern Cemetery. And tonight uh, he joins us to talk about his latest book, billboard monuments in Maine. So I'm going to turn it over to Ron uh, in a moment. Um, just a reminder, folks, if you have questions, I'm going to be monitoring the chat feature throughout the program. You can also type them into the Q&A feature, which you should see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of those um, questions as we can. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Ron. Great. I think we're good to go. You can hear me okay. Yes. Great, okay. Um, so thank you so much for uh, joining me tonight for this virtual book launch. This is my third book, as Kathleen said, and it's the first time I've done a launch um, virtually, so it's kind of an exciting and new way of doing things because people from all over the place can, can join in. So that's really, that's really great. So thank you for coming. Um, I wanna say, um, right up front, thank you so much to Maine Historical Society for hosting the launch. Um, when I started to talk about this book uh, last fall with John Babin from Visitor Services, he is the one who really turned me on to Maine Office Publishing. So that's where this book was published instead of um, my previous two were out of state. And um, so I thank John for that. Kathleen has been wonderful through this whole planning process because We've had to change plans many times, as you might imagine, as pandemic changed the world, but um, she's one who really sticks to it. So if you ever need help sticking to something long-term, call Kathleen, she's great at that. Um, I also wanna say thanks to Tiffany in the research library. Um, she's always available to me, and I you know, reach out to her by phone and email and go in and see her when the place is open. So um, special thanks to those folks from Maine Historical. And again, Maine Office Publishing for, for, for doing this book. So let's get started. I'm gonna show, we're gonna zip through a ton of slides. It'll be a lot of quick looks at images so that you won't get bored, hopefully, and we'll learn a little bit as we go. Um, so there's about 75 in all, and we're still gonna get this done, I think, in a, in a half an hour. So here's a picture from Evergreen Cemetery in Portland. And the idea of this one is, you know, you visit a um, 19th century cemetery and what you experience is the verticality of the landscape. Most of the monuments are reaching for the sky. You can see this image shows that quite well. We've got a lot of vertical monuments. Typical family monuments that we find in Maine uh, and elsewhere, um, obelisks, pedestal monuments, columns, they're, they're vertical I mean, and the inscriptions for the families are typically top to bottom as you can see on these. And it's just the, the nature of how um, the cemeteries were decorated with monuments in the 1800s. Even the ledger slabs which lie flat either on the ground on the right as you can see or on a table tomb or box tomb, the pictures on the left are inscribed such that if you were to lift that stone up, it's top to bottom. So the inscription goes vertical. There are exceptions, often for children's monuments, 
that are in the ground. You can see a couple of examples here in Maine from Naples and Newfield, where um, very young children were memorialized by their families on these horizontal monuments, but they are um, in fact in the ground. So we're talking about billboard monuments and what makes a monument a billboard is the airspace. The illustration in the center is of a billboard monument with the panel in the center, the two posts holding it up, but it's not at ground level, it is being held above ground. Uh, we find that the slabs that are inscribed are up to seven feet long, up to three feet tall. So these are, these are massive stones. They're usually about an inch and a half thick. That's the, the common size, although there are some that are quite a bit thicker, which adds a ton of weight. And the, the dry weight of the largest ones are, are just under 500 pounds. So that's a lot of weight being held up in the air. And when the rain or moisture gets um, into that stone, you can add another 15 or 20 percent um, to the, po the pounds of weight. So we're talking about, you know, again, lots of um, weight being held up um, above ground. The typical billboard monument, the makers of these monuments would um, divide the inscription in slab into panels to memorialize, you know, one for each usually, as you can see on this one, four. And many of these have a metal rod between the posts, which helps support the monument because the sheer weight of these stones would tend to splay those posts apart and the metal rod helps keep them together. Along the top, you can see some typical cemetery signage that I snapped along the way in my travels. And if you look at the large picture in the bottom, it's very easy as you're zipping up Route 4 in Auburn, Maine. Um, as you look out the window on your right, you would see this sign and it sure looks like a cemetery sign, but in fact, it's our first billboard monument. Um, this is for the Levitt family that's at Plains Cemetery in Auburn. And you can see that it's in fact a memorial for five members of that family. This is what I call a drop slot model of billboard monument. You can imagine that to put this thing together in the cemetery, they would have probably put those posts in the ground first with the slots that have been carved in them, and then they could slide that stone slab right down into the post. So it's a drop slot because the, that drops right in. The other type that's most common is the pocket slot. You can see on the right, especially um, the stone um, make the stone carvers would carve these notches out of the post to fit those uh, slabs in there. These would be more challenging to put up in a cemetery because you either have to put the thing together and then lift it all as one piece, or you'd have to put the posts in, splay them, and then um, you know, put the slab in and then put them back together. So the drop slot was a little easier, I think, to, to probably install in cemeteries. Here's another um, pocket slot one. This is a nice one, nicely decorated in Livermore Falls. And you know, the, the panels name um, a young woman, wife of the uh, patriarch of the family, and their two children who all died within a very short time, um, less than a month in 1848. And so they're each getting a panel, and then below the children, the carver inscribed um, an epitaph, friends and physicians could not save their mortal bodies from the grave nor can the grave confine them here when Christ shall call them to appear. So these were, you know, utilitarian slabs that named um, people who died and their dates, but also like um, tablet markers, we find epitaphs on some of them. This particular one, um, the patriarch of the family, Alicia or Elisha Pettengill, outlasted his wife and two children by 50 or more years. And when he died in 1906, someone in the family had his name inscribed on the reverse side. So this is the reverse side of the one that we just looked at. And that's the unique thing about these monuments is that they are gravestones that by their very nature um, allowed for people to be inscribed on, on both sides. And, and there are a few that have that. So the metal rod that I told you about at the beginning that helps to keep these things supported generally run below, as you can see on the right, it's just below that marble slab. The one on the left from a gunquit, um, you can see it's off center and a little um, above that marker. So it wasn't always below. Um, this one also um, down on the south coast in Wells, 
also, it's uh, very close to the ground, as you can see. This is just for a couple, not for a whole family. Um, Anne Hubbard, who was on the right panel, died in 1796. He, her husband, remarried a woman named Alice Wheelwright. And then a year after their marriage, uh, we find this newspaper notice that he ran for uh, a couple of months. Notice, whereas Alice, wife of me, the subscriber, has escaped from my bed and board and has behaved herself in a very unbecoming manner. This therefore is to forbid all persons harboring or trusting her on my account, as I will not pay one cent of her contracting after this date. So I don't know exactly how they resolve the differences, but they apparently were together for uh, the remainder of his life. When he died in 1819, she ended up remarrying for the fourth time. Some of these are attached by bolts, not just listed, not just um, slotted into the posts themselves. This one, the Butterfield Monument in Wilton, uh, you can see the, um, the metal post, the metal bolts that are holding that to the, to the actual granite posts. Some of them are also attached with hooks. The one on the left you can see is a slate. There's only three slates uh, in the collection in, in Maine out of 40. There are only three that are slate. The majority are marble. Um, this one you can see it's attached to the post by the hook. And then that's the full picture of it on the right hand side. And by the way, um, this, a second slate is in this very same cemetery. And I put that note in the bottom. 50% of all the billboards are found in a cemetery where others are also present. So I think what was going on was as these were being placed in cemeteries, families would see them, like the design, and then decide that they wanted one for themselves, for their own family. And um, that explains why so many of them are in, in a cemetery with others. These, again, two slates are in Poland, Maine, and there's another one in Cumberland. So sometimes uh, bolting the uh, slab to the post they could run it all the way through two posts, as you can see in this one in J, and it creates a family lot, a fenced family lot. And this is just for a couple. There's, a, there's another one that's uh, for a family that we'll see in a minute. Some of them had metal supports, not granite posts. Here's the reverse side of one in Cumberland. It's one of the larger monuments in the collection of 40 that are known. Um, and you can see it's held up by this metal structure that looks to be original to the monument around 1850. This is the front. You can see there's a really interesting um, flower design on the top of the monument. It's quite special because most of them are just plain slabs. But this is for the um, Prince family, and there are six people memorialized on this marker from the 1840s primarily. So that's when, when this was done in the late 1840s to early 1850s. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's another one with a metal um, frame, really interesting, and it's the only one like it. It looks to be these large metal rods were, you know, curled up and over, and then on the left-hand side, you can see the clip that holds that stone in place. This one, of course, is slipping uh, from its metal supports, but it's just another way that they would hold these monuments up off the ground. This is another example of uh, four, you know, four little kids, or four young children of one family all being memorialized on one stone. We'll see a few more of those in a minute. So there's four that are of this type. Look first at the picture on the bottom left and you can see that there's a, an exposed base in the ground with these metal clamps coming up from the ground. And then the picture on the top is the, is the one that is more common, the three other ones the um, base is buried below ground, so all you see are those metal clamps coming up out of the ground itself. Um, these are an interesting um, variation of the theme, but the fact that they are held above grade makes them fit the definition of billboard monument. Here's the, another one in that same family. This is an interesting one for a couple of reasons. Note that the slab has been cut with this triangular top. It's just for a couple. Um, Archibald and Abigail Thompson, who died, he died first in 1859, she's second, 1861. What's really interesting about this monument is, look to the left-hand side first. That's the back of the marker. You can see the picket fence in the background. And if you look closely, you can see that the inscription, there is it's writing on this reverse side. Then you flip the picture 90 degrees, you can see that in fact, it's the original stone for Archibald Thompson that was cut in 1859. 
and it was a much more lengthy um, uh, inscription, including an epitaph at the bottom. His wife died so quickly after he, I think the family probably had his marker just pulled up, flipped over, and then recut with, the, uh, with their inscription on the other side. So this is a recycled marker and it makes it quite special. The tallest in the collection is in Saco. This is for the cuts, um, Polly and Dominicus cuts. There's three feet height to this slab and weighs almost 400 pounds dry. Uh, the smallest and the easiest to overlook is in Kennebunk Port um, for George Ward. This is a cenotaph. He died in Charleston, South Carolina. The stones you see behind him are for the other family members. There's a family plot of eight and the family put this monument up for him in front of the others. You can see there's his little um, 30 inch long uh, billboard monument sinking into the ground, but nevertheless, it's a billboard with the rest of his family just behind him. So the longest is actually a double. This comes in at 15 feet. It's two panels, three posts that you can, as you can see here for the Hardy family. And um, if you look on the upper right, that's the left-hand side of the Hardy monument. Notice that the panel to the left is blank. This is for Levi Hardy and his wife, Eliza. The panel on the left is blank. It's no doubt for his second wife. After Eliza died, he remarried. And um, I'm sure he intended for her to be buried um, at this cemetery with him and inscribed in the panel. But she lived another 20 years and moved to Vermont to be with her daughter. She died there and has a gravestone there, so she never made it onto this panel. Similarly, on the bottom um, uh, slate at Cumberland, this was put up in the late 40s for two uh, daughters of the Blanchards. They were inscribed on the center, two panels, and running across their names, it says Daughters of, and it's the Blanchard family. Um, the panel on the left is blank and no doubt was um, intended for Mr. and Mrs. Blanchard. The panel on the right is for one of their sons who died a few years after the girls and he was inscribed after the fact. That panel on the left was never inscribed. They are buried in the same cemetery, but they have their own markers. So that one is remaining blank. So, you know, we all are certainly for the last few months have been having epidemic illness on our minds. And these monuments were actually for the time, a perfect way for a family to memorialize the loss of a great number of people in their family all at once. Instead of having to buy individual markers, they would buy a billboard marker and they could decorate it with the names of um, multiple people. Three, three children aged five to 10 who died of influenza in Buxton in 1875 were memorialized on this um, billboard stone at the Torrey Hill or South Buxton Cemetery. Three more who died in a month in 1852 were memorialized on this stone in Wells they were aged two to five, cause of death is unknown. One sibling had predeceased them in 1849, uh, Mary, and she's listed on there as well. Um, all of these children are on the pedestal, the monument that's just to the right behind the billboard. You can see the name Hill, and we'll take a look at that now. Um, it's interesting that you can see that the billboard monument is in this family lot. The pedestal is standing just uh, beside it, these kids are on both of those monuments. And the pedestal also has their parents and their father's first wife. So this one is five children lost over a two week period in 1863. This monument's the southernmost in the collection in York Village. They died um, aged two to 11 of diphtheria. Only a brother who was eight years old at the time named Benjamin survived what took these children down. This is um, a very interesting monument that a few people have sent me uh, um, pictures of. It is of the right era. It's in you know, the right place, which is Maine, and it's the right stuff. It memorializes six people in the Grover family who died between 1847 and 48, typhus fever taking five of them. And what's really interesting about this one is it's not technically a billboard because it's in a slotted base on the ground but it sure has everything else going for it like, like all the other billboards do. And somebody the other day asked me if I thought this might have once been up on um, posts and maybe it fell and they just reset it in the ground. But if you look carefully at the left-hand margin of that stone, 
that inscription goes right up to the edge and that would really not allow for them to have put that in a slotted post or drop it into a, a drop, drop slot. So I think this one probably always was in the ground and it's, uh, you know, it's a thin stone as well. It's about an inch and a half thick. There are a few others that we've found along the way that are in the ground, long panels like this, but they're usually four or five inches thick like a regular gravestone. This one really fits the model of um, billboard, all except for the fact that it's not up above the ground. So the family I said died of um, typhus fever in the paper that was um, published January 1848. Within the red box on the left, you can see that six of the people in this family are named in this um, death notice of dying of typhus fever all within a short period of time of one another. One of them died of cholera. And then the matriarch of the family, Hadassah Grover, on the right, she died um, just after this one was published, just a couple of weeks later um, at age 52. So um, they all died except for one of typhus fever. I looked at the statistics from the census in 1860, the eighth US census, and this was the first year that the United States collected massive amounts of um, mortality information at the census level and split it out by state. So it's really the first time we have a picture of causes of death. And it's great for, for us today because this is exactly the time period that these monuments were being constructed. So in 1860, the top five causes of death in Maine were consumption, typhoid fever, old age scarlet fever, and pneumonia. Now, typhus, typhus fever is what these people were all um, supposedly died of a bacterial infection spread by fleas and lice, whereas typhoid fever is a bacterial infection spread by contaminated food and water. Um, with some similar symptoms outcomes, they were actually thought to be the same disease until around 1860, which is why in the stats for the United States, they don't mention typhus fever as the newspaper did. They talk about typhoid fever. But by the um, 1870 census, uh, they started to recognize that these were two separate illnesses and they did talk about the prevalence of diseases being typhoid and typhus. So they separated them out at that point. But it's just interesting that Maine is calling it typhoid fever at this time. These people all died of typhus fever, according to the paper. So looking at the stats again, this is the age at time of death for over 7,600 people in Maine in 1860. You can see the bands, age band 0 to 10 through 91 plus. Um, just for the heck of it, I decided to put a similar plot of the 184 people who were memorialized on billboards against that same um, wage, uh, age bands. And boy, even though their deaths occurred over different dates, not just 1860, that um, sure mirrors um, the overall picture in 1860 in Maine. It's just almost an exact match. So these are really apples and oranges, but but boy, that um, apple sure looks like that orange to me. So not only children are memorialized on these, th this is a really uh, cool one, the Sawyer Monument in Cumberland. It's a marble that's hooked onto its posts, as you can see. And this is for the, uh, Reuben Sawyer and his four wives, Betsy, Olive, Susan, and Jane. Um, so he married oh, four times over 30 years. Each time one of his wives died, he married a younger woman. But nevertheless, he outlived them all. Um, he died in 1848. But on this marker, they are all memorialized, as well as two of his children on the far right-hand side. <clears throat> so in the first chapter of the book, which some of you who have it know already, and those of you who will be purchasing it will soon find out, uh, I make a case for this style of monument coming over with the settlers from England. Um, they used grave rails, see the picture on the lower left, those are wooden markers that run lengthwise down a grave. They would be painted or carved with the names of people. Um, this is one that's found, a set that's found in Georgia, but these are typical for what were found in England in the 16, 1700s and, and beyond. The picture on the right is a really cool set of grave boards. These are actually made of metal although most of them would have been made of wood and painted. So grave rails and grave boards were a design that came over with the settlers 
um, from England, but they would never have lasted in our cemeteries because if they were being made of wood in the 16 and 1700s, they would deteriorate soon. So our billboards are mid 1800s, far after these, but that, that, that there is a case to be made for that's the, um, the starting point for this model of grave marker. So they were made between the 1830s and 1880s, so about a 50 year period, but you can see that certainly mid-century, 50s and 60s was primarily when the monuments were constructed. The oldest comes in um, 1834, this is uh, down in Parsons Field. It's a two panel limestone marker, and you can see that the way the maker of the stone um, inscribed it across the two panels. So it reads across built 1834 and then on the left sacred to the memory of and on the right family of Samuel Lord. And then the panel on the right is blank. Otherwise, the panel on the left is loaded with family names. So there was plenty of room for more families to uh, family members to be named, but they never made it onto the monument. This one is dated um, in Yarmouth. It's for Cyrus Sargent. You can see on the top right that the masonry symbols are flanked by these two urns. They're blown up below, erected 1853. That was the year his uh, first wife died. So Cyrus Sargent himself lived till 1880. Um, he actually has a very interesting story. He was arrested in a prison in 1861, um, accused of being a spy for the Confederacy. Um, he's got a wonderful story and I'd love for you to hear it, but we don't have time tonight, so you'll need to read the book to find out what happened to Cyrus Sargent. Here's a picture, two pictures of his uh, billboard monument in Yarmouth. The top is before I cleaned it a few years ago, maybe three years ago. The bottom is after it was cleaned. This is the longest slab coming in at seven feet. This is about a 450 pound piece of stone being held above the ground. Related uh, and in the same cemetery, in the same family, is this other one. Um, you can see that this is a so separate into three panels for brothers, sisters, father and mother of a man named um, Joseph Hill, who had this erected in 1859. Notice the big crack that goes all the way through between panels two and three, and somebody had put a post underneath to hold that thing together. Uh, I'm sad to show you that just um, in the last couple of months, this one has actually fallen. The picture on the right shows you the after picture, the one on the left is before. I'm working with the town and the family and one of my friend conservators to try and get that one repaired. Um, so who made the markers? There's four ways that I found to identify who made the markers. Um, and this one in Ripley, which is in this picture covered with greenery, which is actually quite beautiful. The first way to identify a gravestone maker is business records. This one, you can see this business record from the Baker Emery and Company from Skowhegan in 1856. Over on the left, you'll see the, um, the gentleman who ran the shop took the order at four feet wide, two feet long to be lettered lengthwise. And then he wrote them um, the inscription, Lydia P., wife of Nathaniel Goodwin, who died January 4th, 1856 at 42. Their infant daughter died at age 10 weeks in 1855. And then he's got the um, epitaph, though lifeless now the caskets lay beneath the cold, cold sod, their spirits have triumphantly wafted their way to God. And then Nathaniel Goodwin is named as the man who ordered it. You can see Ripley, the town on the right, and you can see the cost to the stone was $13.97. Um, five miles east uh, is another marker for Lydia. You see it on the left here. Her husband passed away in 1862. And he was buried in this cemetery. I think they may have moved Lydia over to be with him and put the two matching monuments at that cemetery in Dexter. But the, but the, the uh, billboard still stays where it is. And then just as a map just showing you um, over a 25 mile span where the shop was located in Skowhegan, where the billboard is, and then where the final location of the Goodwin graves are. Okay, the second way to identify a maker is by a signature on this one, and there are three of them. Here's uh, three that, that fall into that category. Here's one that is another fenced lot in Wilton, and you can see on the image on the left, barely see it, but it's R. Smith Dixfield, that's Richard Smith, the stonecutter, for about 20 years. 
here's an advertisement of his when he was working in Portland with another stone cutter named Cheney. <clears throat> he left stone cutting to become a shoemaker uh, around this time of the Civil War. Now, the center panel on this marker is, uh, sorry, is the only one inscribed. The two panels on either side are unused. This is for the wife and child of Ephraim um, Woodman. And um, this is his picture in his Civil War uniform. Why he's not on that monument with his wife and child, of course, you're going to want to read the book to find that out. A uh, third way to figure out who made these markers is through probate. This is for um, Dr. Ira Thing and his two wives. Note the empty photo pocket just above his name on the right-hand side. That would have originally held a daguerreotype or tintype of Dr. Thing, um, long since gone, of course. But um, nevertheless, uh, there is a probate file which tells us who made this monument. So on the left, this is the record of estate expenses from 1866. And you can see I highlighted that the estate paid $70 to W.H. Rollins for gravestones. And then over on the right, the arrow points to William H. Rollins. Uh, he was a marble worker listed in the 1856 Maine Business Directory at that time operating out of Standish. He was a stone cutter for about 20 years. The last way to identify a maker is because I say so. Um, and I'll explain what I mean. This is uh, Joseph Thompson, a successor to Bartlett Adams, who was the subject of my first book. He was a stone cutter for about 35 years, and here's an um, advertisement, a typical one he placed in the paper. Um, he didn't sign a marker. He didn't um, have a probate. Uh, so how do I know it's him? Well, here is a marker that he did sign nearby in Cumberland in 1848 for Amelia Ann Sturdivant. And you can see on the left, J.R. Thompson, Portland. And on the right, you can see the lettering and numbering in the decoration. I compared that, which is the top stone, the one he signed, to the Four Wives billboard, which was made also in 1848. And if you look, as I did, closely at the numbers and the letters, you'll find that it is, in fact, the same hand. It makes perfect sense. Both of these monuments are in Cumberland. They're both 1848. He was the key guy in Portland at the time, uh, so I assigned this marker to him, although um, it's just, again, because I say so. Um, someone at a recent talk asked me if the ads of the time showed billboard monuments in them, and I haven't found one yet. Um, these are just three ads I pulled out of newspapers to show you typical mid-century um, advertisements. I love the one in the lower left because they, notice they have the gravestone tilting. And you'd think that a stone cutter would probably want to have um, an image of, of them being upright and in place, but uh, that one, they, they decided to have it tilting off to the side. <clears throat> so here's a map of the billboard monuments in Maine. If you know Maine, you, you know that I'm showing you the coastal uh, region to about half the state up. That's where all of these are located. Um, the orange diamonds are the ones that are included in the book. There are 38. There were two that have been discovered since we published. And those are the two blue, blue monuments. Um, so 40 of them in Maine. There are six in Vermont that I've seen, one in Western Massachusetts. And the um, none in New Hampshire, surprisingly, so far. I've been asking people to look. Uh, and there may be one in Pennsylvania that someone, Tina Utter, just sent me a picture of that looks like it's a good candidate for a billboard need to look at that a little more closely. But the interesting difference between the Maine and the Western New England stones are those posts are made of white marble, which is, the, of course, locally quarried in uh, Connecticut River Valley. So that makes sense. They used marble instead of granite. All of these have a story to tell. This one looking at on the right in Bass Cove in Kennecourt tells the story of Captain Leander Foss, who went down with his ship in 1842 on the bark Isidore and all 15 men were lost during that storm. And the full story is, of course, in the book. It's a, it's a really interesting, interesting read. How are these holding up? And not very well. You, you can imagine that hundreds of pounds of stone being held up above ground for you know, 150 years isn't a good um, situation. This one in Garland, you can see they've tried to fix these cracking posts by putting metal rods around them to hold them up. Here's uh, one where the two the hooks have just corroded and bust, burst through on one of them. 
And on the left-hand side, you can see it's cracking. So that probably too will break at some point with the freeze-thaw cycle. Um, more than 50% of all billboards have some structural problems too. So they're all destined to fail at some point. Uh, this one in Poland is a slate which has no posts anymore. So the town has rigged this um, temporary stand made out of a recycled town sign to hold that above ground. At Eastern Cemetery in Portland, the James Hughes family monument is missing its slab, although the two posts are there. Um, he was involved in a really interesting scandal that ran in the newspapers for quite some time, and that's all detailed in the book. So uh, full cracks on some of these, as you can see on these two. Um, stress fractures along the bottom of many of these markers. Slipping from their posts, as you can see this one in Jackson. Falling completely from their post, as this one in Wilton. This is a really interesting monument for Charles Adams. He was a drummer in the 8th Maine Regiment. His wife and ch only child had died um, before him, and he was on his way home to Maine, actually, when he died in New York City. So here's Dr. Thing again. Um, he was an eclectic physician who had an amusing difficulty focusing in on occupation. And yep, it's in the book. Um, but you can see his monument is really leaning heavily, the whole thing, post, metal rod, and slab. Uh, the Tapley family down in Kennebunkport, on the upper right, you can see the hole drilled in the top. That's where a decorative cap would have been. Lower right, you can see Tristram, uh, he is missing a photo in his panel. And this one memorializes eight members of the family. Um, the matriarch of the family did a very brave thing for a woman in 1868. And I'll leave it there and let you read about it in the book. Um, we're at the end. This is a really interesting, um, not exactly a billboard, but sure seems like one. This is a spinner. That marble eight-sided piece you could be spun so you could read the different inscriptions on it. Um, today, that metal piece on the top has been fitted that doesn't allow the, the monument to be spun any longer. But at, in the day, it would have been. It's just a really cool kind of variation of the theme up above ground, um, not quite a slab, but I still um, certainly covered it in the book. OK, if you want to learn more, um, there are interviews that were videoed um, on the 207 show on Total Maine, um, Maine CW station. It's in Up Portland Magazine and Bangor Daily News, so you can read and see all of those if you want to see a little bit more about this. Of, of course, if that doesn't convince you, um, here's what readers are saying. I'm reading small sections each night to extend the delight of reading it. A really terrific book that will be of great interest in history buffs in Maine a significant contribution to Gravescombe scholarship. Fascinating and clearly well-researched, your enthusiasm and humor pop off each page. And I don't know how you find out all this stuff and then deliver it to us in such a delightful, chatty way. I'll take chatty. So Museum Shop at Main Circle is now open. They're stocked with autographed copies of the book. You can check their website for hours. Um, I, of course, have books as well. There's my email address if you have any questions um, uh, about the book or about any of the monuments in Maine. Send me an email, please. I'll be happy to chat with you about them. Of course, if you find one that's not on the list, I'd love to know about it as well. So I've gone a little over 30 minutes, but that's it. And I'm happy to take questions if we have any. Thank you, Ron. Uh, that, was, that was fantastic. We Great. do have a couple questions for you um, that are coming in. One um, from Jennifer Stucker. Um, was the 1850 mortality census not reported by the state? Yeah, the, uh, no, the 1850 census is there. Um, there's only one that wasn't reported. I think it was 1880, it's just a fragment. The 1850 census, I believe, is there. But um, I think there's a problem with that particular one. But they also didn't do the subsequent reports, which had um, all, you know, all the mortality and other information. 1860 was the first year they did that. From Bob Gordon, um, why do you think the cause of death was sometimes noted on gravestones of this era? Yeah, I mean, that really would have been up to um, the family to decide if they wanted to put um, a cause of death on there. Sometimes we see accidental deaths, drownings, 
things like that. Sometimes we see the disease, but most of the disease information for these people I got off vital records versus off gravestones. We have a couple questions um, from Star uh, Helsu, if I'm if I'm mispronouncing your name, Star. My apologies. Um, was the drop slot on those billboard monuments used? so they could slide it out and add more to it? Uh, very good question. And I think that probably uh, certainly could have happened as they added names, they could more easily remove that slab, take it back to the shop and do the inscription. It would have certainly been more challenging for the other ones which were you know, in, solidly in place. So yeah, that, that probably, um, uh, probably happened, yes. Another question from Star was, is it, was it common to move bodies from one location to another? Yeah, it really was. Um, we don't really think today about doing that as much, but in, in the um, 19th century, there are tons of people who were moved from one place to another. Sometimes that was because, you know, you think about rural Maine being so rural um, through that century. So many families were buried in their own backyards and family lots. And some towns, as they grew, um, set aside these large uh, sections of, of cemetery and encouraged people to have their family lots basically closed down and move bodies over to the, to the um, town cemeteries. So many did it that way. Other people, you know, they sold their farm and moved elsewhere and they wanted to bring the bodies with them. They didn't want to leave them behind to somebody else. So yeah, we see a lot of, um, lot of removals, especially in Portland at Eastern Cemetery, which it, um, you all heard as, as a, my second book, um, there were hundreds of people moved out of there when it was so full and other cemeteries in Portland became available. They encouraged removal. So yeah, there was a lot of that happening. Max Gordon asks, uh, regarding the verses that are on gravestones, are they generally written by the families or was there some type of catalog that the Masons uh, had that you could choose from, that you could select the inscriptions from? Yeah, it's probably a combination. I don't know if I've ever seen an actual catalog of epitaphs. Uh, epitaphs. I, I, I think one of the carvers, Alpheus Carey, published one of those in the um, 1800s, but that's the only one I know of. But a lot of these are also biblical. And so many religious families would you know, choose a, a biblical verse. There's a few other ones that are very, very commonly seen. Uh, and, uh, on stones. And that would be something that people would have seen and just wanted or the stone cutter would have recommended that. Many of them don't have epitaphs at all, but it was you know, just a choice of the family to, to add that on. You know, these stones are all hand cut. Every letter costs a certain amount of money. And so some people would just have the basic inscription. Others would have full inscriptions and all kinds of epitaph, and that would have cost them much more. Thanks very much. I think those are, those are all the questions that we have. Great. We're getting a lot of uh, very positive feedback in the chat feature, um, and it's really great to hear, too, how many of you who uh, may not have been able to attend this talk, if it had been in person, um, because you're tuning in from somewhere outside of Maine. There are a lot of people that have said uh, they were really grateful for this, this opportunity to do this online. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thank you, Ron, uh, so much for, for such an excellent talk. Thank you. So as I said earlier, folks, uh, we're recording this, um, and I, my guess is that probably within a week it should be available uh, for anyone who would like to, to see it or to share it uh, on our website. You can learn more about our programming, which, which presently is 100% is virtual uh, Maine Historical Society programs, when you visit our website at mainehistory.com. Dot org. And that's also where you can see uh, previously recorded programs, listen to our podcast. There's lots of great resources there. We do have autographed copies of Ron's book available at our museum store, which is at uh, 489 Congress Street in Portland, Maine. Um, check our website for hours. Currently, we're open Wednesday through Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Um, but certainly there are a lot of um, new procedures in place to, to keep everybody safe and healthy. Uh, so check the website for that information and um, keep your eye on the website just in case our, our hours should have to change. Um, and if you visit our website too, again, mainhistory.org, 
Uh, if you're not local, um, you can visit our online store um, and you can purchase the book and lots of other great books about Maine uh, online. So thank you all again so much for joining us and uh, I hope that we'll uh, see everyone back here for our next virtual program. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.